Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Keisha Pollock-Porter, the Vice Dean for Faculty and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. In this podcast, we continue to examine racism as a public health crisis. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Dana Williamson, a Scientific Integrity Fellow at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Research and Development, and Dr. Aisha Dickerson, faculty at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, for a conversation about structural racism and environmental injustice. All right, Dr. Dickerson and Dr. Williamson, thank you so much for being with me today. And I'm really excited for this conversation to unpack issues of environmental justice as we think about the connections between racism and health and racism as a public health crisis. Dr. Dickerson, just wondering if I can start with you, if you can just tell us what environmental justice is and what it means for you. Why why do you do this work? Well, environmental justice, or I usually like to say environmental injustice because we haven't really reached any any uh, version of justice yet. But it's this disproportionate burden of environmental exposures in very vulnerable populations. And when we think vulnerable, we think uh, low-income communities, communities with a greater portion of non-white residents, and communities with a lot of immigrants. And those are usually vulnerable populations in a lot of different sectors, but more so in determining where people dump their hazardous waste. So that's the gist of environmental justice. Okay. And you are from uh, Alabama, if I recall correctly. And so can you tell me, does that experience of growing up in Alabama impact why you are involved in this work? Or if it does, how does it? Well, yeah, I think the biggest issue with studying environmental justice is that people tend to focus their energies on looking at inner city exposures. And the greatest thing about living in Alabama is that I get to see a variety of different, or I got to see a variety of different communities. So I would see disproportionate burden of exposures within the inner city or what we consider bigger cities in Alabama, and then also within rural communities. So as a health inspector in Birmingham, Alabama, I would inspect in North Birmingham where there were a lot of industrial facilities. Now you would think people would inspect those facilities, but I would inspect the kitchens that would serve the employees within those facilities. And even being in those kitchens, I could smell what was being uh, released into the air from those facilities. And it made me think, well, what are the people living around these industrial facilities being exposed to? Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That is really such a powerful image of being inside the workplace and thinking, okay, something is happening here because I am clearly recognizing the impacts on the community that is outside of these facilities. Yeah, what about you, Dr. Williamson? When you think about environmental injustices or environmental justice, environmental racism, how do you define that? How do you conceptualize that? And what brings you to this space? Where are you coming from? Thank you, Keisha. So in quoting the father of environmental justice, uh, Dr. Robert Bullard, it is everything with respect to where we live, work, go to school, play, and worship. And really, in the U.S., it's the low-income communities and the black and brown folks that have the worst health outcomes. And many of these outcomes are attributable to the differences in their environmental exposure. And what about you in terms of your journey? You know, I know um, one of the things I love about this conversation is Aisha is from Alabama. You're from Detroit. Does does growing up in Detroit influence how you think about this work or what brought you to this work? Absolutely. So being from a city of Detroit, it's a place that has many EJ issues. But if you could just picture, so there's the Detroit-Windsor Tunnel, and this is the connection point, Windsor, Canada, 
to Detroit, Michigan, and this is a gateway where there are 12,000 cars that pass to and from Canada every day. So you could just imagine the magnitude of pollution that's emitted in the downtown Detroit area on a daily basis. And then there's also the Ambassador Bridge, which is also a route from Canada to this small little community. It's Delray, Mexican town in southwest Detroit, predominantly low-income minority community. But this is also where there's a high density of car facilities because, you know, Detroit is the motor city. But traveling back and forth from Canada, there's about 9,000 18-wheeler trucks that pass through daily. So this community also suffers from high rates of pollution and subsequent high rates of asthma and cancer. Thank you for that that example, Dana. Really, again, giving me such a nice visual for somebody who's never driven all the way through, uh, driven on these bridges or, or through these areas from Detroit up to Canada. It brings to mind, it makes me want to just go back to you, Aisha, and think about, you know, this, you mentioned the community in, in Alabama and your inspections work. What about the work that you've been doing recently as a faculty member? Are there particular communities or stories that come to mind when we think about environmental injustice and, and what you've seen? Do you have a specific example or story you'd like to share? Well, currently, the studies that I'm working on are more population-based in over the, the entire United States, which makes it difficult for me to, to pinpoint specific point sources of exposure. But I am working with one of the Bloomberg fellows on a study that she has or she envisioned in Uniontown, Alabama. So the issue with Uniontown is, is very rural. And I think when people see wide open fields, they think, oh, this is a great place to dump something. Nobody will notice it. It's just a wide open field. And so uh, Uniontown has a field full of coal ash. They have a field full of uh, refuse from a cheese factory. They have a field where they spray sewage into this field. It's called a spray field. And then that sewage just sits there on top of the land. And so because the area is rural, and it has a higher concentration of lesser educated residents, then industries tend to just dump there with no expectation of having anyone fight them or fight against them uh, around it. Mm -hmm. So uh, this student, Azita Amiri, one of the Bloomberg Fellows, came up with this program to educate the high school students within that area on how to test soil and water samples and then we plan on training them to advocate for their communities and then also train them to further train the high school students that are coming in behind them so that as they transition out of Uniontown, there's another group of people who can come in and continue the work that we're doing there. So that's one of the things I'm working on. That's a great example of a strategy in terms of how do we, what are solutions in terms of really moving forward? Uh, that's a, a great project where you're teaching and working with residents about how they can take their own samples and lifting them up as advocates to sort of really stand up against these injustices that are happening in these communities. Dana, I know you've been doing a lot of work in community around solutions as well and, and wondering if you can share with us, like, what have you seen working in terms of addressing these, these injustices? Sure. Well, through my uh, dissertation research, I had the opportunity to evaluate the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Environmental Justice Academy. And so this was an academy that was specifically implemented in Region 4 in the Atlanta area. However, in, persons who were interested in advocating for their community could come from anywhere. And it was a nine-month a nine month training leadership development program. And through this program, the academy attendees learned strategic ways to interact with their community members. And it was really a program that was building capacity. And so when I say building capacity, the EJ fellows were able to identify the specific characteristics in their community that they could leverage to enable them or empower them to see the changes and make the changes that they wanted. Thank you for those examples. One of the things that comes to mind that I'm hearing is in, in this example in, in Region 4 in Atlanta and in your example, Aisha, in terms of, of Alabama, these issues are not specific to one area of this country. I think you can go anywhere in this country and see environmental injustices, look at environmental racism and see these impacts. When you think about why this is continuing to happen, we have 
hundreds of years of these types of experiences, like, of these injustices. What do you think are the root causes of these environmental injustices that we're seeing? Either of you would love to hear your thoughts on that. I think part of the issue, at least thinking about neighborhoods within the Deep South, is that when you're thinking about health outcomes from environmental exposures, you think about cardiovascular disease, asthma, and dementia, and things like that. But when you when you go to people in Alabama, they say, oh, you know, they have cardiovascular disease and kidney disease because of what they eat. It's all about what they eat. And since people have pinpointed that as the, the problem, they tend to overlook other potential problems like air pollution. So uh, another study that I'm working on in collaboration with Roland Thorpe is looking at the interaction between air pollution exposures and psychosocial stressors that are commonly experienced by historically marginalized communities. Because in addition to the adverse health outcomes from air pollution, we know that stressors, uh, whether that be crime levels within the neighborhood or just living check to check, those things can also increase adverse health outcomes. So we're looking at the interaction between those two exposures because we know that both of these are more likely to be exposed in vulnerable populations. So uh, that's that's one of the things that we're doing with the thought that it's not just one exposure that's causing these this adverse health. It's a combination of things. So people should stop picking on that that one source and look at the overall picture. Mm -hmm. That's really important because it it also means that we can't just focus on one thing, right? It's a system. There are lots of of challenges, lots of injustices, racism in terms of affecting what people have access to to eat, in terms of clean air, in terms of safe places to be outside, everything is very connected. What about you, Dana? What do you... What have you seen or what do you believe are the root causes of, of environmental injustices? You know, just to piggyback on, on that last statement, I mean, of course, the focus is on what people eat. But when you focus on people's poor health outcomes, you have to also understand that there's a connection between race and place. And what people are eating is a result of what they have access to. And if in their communities, there's only access to nutrition poor a lack of of healthy grocery stores or an overabundance of fast food restaurants, then that is what they have access to in their own communities, which also are the subsequent reasons why there may be more or greater poor health outcomes. And so all of those things are related to structural and systematic inequities. And that's really what drives environmental injustice, because you have those, you know, you have your black and brown and low income communities that are living in the higher density pollution facility locations because those communities are specifically targeted. And I would also quote one of my mentors and friends, Sakobi Wilson, that often refers to these communities as sacrifice zones because that's the locations where industry is abundant and transportation thoroughfares and all the things that are unhealthy. You know, the folks that are there may not be affluent and may not be white communities. And so they tend to have less economic power. And as a result, they have less political power to resist all of the poor nutrition and all of the heavy, unhealthy things that come into their neighborhoods. I really want to lift that up. Both of you are talking about these these strong connections between race and place. And I love this framing from Sokobi around sacrifice zones and, and the fact that industry dumps in certain areas as whether it's urban areas or rural areas, as we heard both of you describe. I wanted to just see if there's anything else you think is really important for our audience to know about environmental injustice, about environmental racism. One of the things that you both lifted up was the importance of community and working with community as we think about solutions. And I want to just see if there's anything else you think is really important for our listeners to know about this topic. I would say a continued focus on community capacity. And that is, again, the strengths that a community has from within to be able to tackle the issues. Because, you know, the folks that live in these communities are the ones that they have their own lived experience. And they're the experts and can often be the ones that can give you the true insight for how these all these inequities can be alleviated. And so when we think about researchers being uh, vehicles to assist communities in this regard, 
I want to continue to focus on community engagement that really lifts up the community experience and allows those that are within that space to really help and navigate finding solutions for some of those inequities that they're experiencing. Yeah, I I agree with that. So it's very important to base our research on community participation. And I think the worst thing a researcher can do is come into somebody else's community and say, look, look at all of this research that I've done. Here's what you need to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other issue that I would like to point out is that the thing with environmental exposures is that once you're exposed, the damage is done. And so it's more important to try to prevent communities from having these industries placed uh, around the area and from introducing these pollutants into the community uh, rather than trying to clean it up later on. Because a lot of pollutants are persistent. Even after you've removed that big factory or you've scraped as much lead paint as you can out of the house, if a child has been exposed, it can store up in the body, in both the bone and the fat. And as that child grows, they are just re-exposed to it over and over again. So it's more important to prevent these exposures rather than try to clean it up later. And a lot of government policies lean more towards cleanup than prevention. And that's part of the issue. Great. Well, thank you both. I just want to express my gratitude for these these important comments and and leave our listeners with the importance that both of you stressed of partnering with community. I was reminded of that image that, that shows, you know, not on us, it's with us, right? So how do we partner with community? You talked about um, really building community capacity, strengthening community's ability to really help to prevent these efforts to help support their role to engage in the policy process, to engage in advocacy and I just applaud the work that you're both doing across the country and really thank you for spending time with us today to help our listeners unpack some of these challenges around environmental injustice and the important connection between race and place and structural racism. So thank you very much for your time. Thank Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.